Back to the action, my friends. Next, we turn to the case of Robinson v. Lindsay. This is another case involving a juvenile defendant. And let's see, I think I'm on Mr. Kalukukui. What was going on? I'm on you, Mr. Kaczynski. Very good. Safety, you're next. So what's going on here? What did this juvenile do? Now take a quick look at the very first couple of lines. I don't see that it was a crash. Do you? I don't really understand how this thumb got severed. Okay, well... Yeah, the line that I read from the very beginning was plain as thumb was severed when it was caught in the tow road. And the question that came to my mind was, how's the driver of the snowmobile even going to know about that? But apparently they did find that it was careless conduct. And the question presented, among others, but the big question was, what standard of care should the child snowmobile driver be held to? What do they have to say about that? Yeah, and in fact, some of the rules, the driving rules, are stricter for the kids, which I've just learned they're a lot stricter now for my almost 16-year-old than they were for me. Right, unless there's a grown-up and stuff like that. In paragraph 3 on page 167, the court writes about the history of this and about how, generally speaking, the standard is somewhat flexible and is based on a reasonable kid, unless the child is engaged in an adult activity. Take a look at the case they cite at the bottom of page 167, Roth v. Union Depot Company, another case from the 1800s. Here, kids need, according to the court, a lower standard of care because they have a lower capacity. But, moving to page 168 at the bottom of the second paragraph, you see that kids that are doing things that are inherently dangerous are held to an adult standard of care, citing a case about operating a motorboat. If you take a look at the paragraphs really in the second half of page 168, the one reading, quote, other courts adopting the adult standard, and goes on, that's a nice statement of the rule that holds a 12-year-old boater to the adult boating standard of care. And then at the bottom of the page we see motorcycles and minibikes. But we've seen a lot of these rules evolve. I remember in around 1970, I was riding a motorcycle around. I never owned a helmet. And now these laws are mandatory even for bicycles. Look at the top of page 169 at note 1, and we get the standard rule, the standard jury instruction for kids, quote, what is reasonable to expect of children of like age, intelligence, and experience. In other words, a reasonable kid standard for kid behavior. Look at note 2. Suppose we've got a really capable, smart kid. Maybe that kid would be held to a somewhat higher standard because he's capable of it, or she. And think about that a little bit. These rules actually are a little fuzzy around the edges, and there's plenty of room 
for counsel to argue the facts in ways that are persuasive and can't affect the result. So if we've got a plaintiff alleging negligent conduct and the defendant is a really smart kid who, quote-unquote, ought to know better, that might actually result in liability where liability would not follow if the kid were average. At note four, we see a number of fairly arbitrary age rules about kids and presumptions about their capacity. And I don't think the authors take those rules very kindly. I think they find them somewhat arbitrary around the edges, and I, I'm inclined to agree that they are. But look at the very bottom of page 169. Okay, a two-year-old in a crib with a lighter is not negative. <coughs> But I would suggest that whoever put that lighter in the kid's reach is negligent. And depending on the circumstances, that might be a case, if I was the plaintiff's counsel, I might allege strict liability. Because I think it's ultra-hazardous to give a kid an, an inflammable, uh, portable matches. Uh, take a look at the top of page 170. The upper age limit for a kid, 17. Note 6 gets into the adult standard of care and also the kid standard later below. And these are, if you, if you read carefully, these are not consistent. Some of these cases are kind of troubling. Okay, the adult standard, it kind of makes sense. Driving an automobile, a motorboat, a motorcycle, a motor scooter, teenager playing golf. Now look at the other side. Special standard for kids, bicycle riding, okay. Deer hunting? Really? Now, if I'm deer hunting in a jurisdiction where kids have a lower standard, I'm going to be in the club. I'm not going to be out in the field with these kids and their weapons. Um, building a fire outdoors, lower standard for kids. But you expect the scoutmaster or the parents are going to be involved. Downhill skiing, a kid standard of care. And then the uh, restatement third of torts, quote, would apply the adult standard to children engaged in dangerous activity that's characteristically undertaken by adults. Now, take a look at the bottom of note 8. What about very old people? Well, it's possible that in reality, a reasonable old person is held to a lower standard than a reasonable young person. Sure. You sure can. And in fact, it's likely that the plaintiff wouldn't even have to really establish breach of duty as a result of being able to argue a per se negligence case from violating the statute. We'll get into negligence per se in a future class. Yeah, exactly. Good reasoning. Yes, the caretaker becomes liable for a couple of different breaches, for letting him out and for letting him have access to the car. And, um, and, and there are gray areas there, too, that are quite interesting about false imprisonment. So you put grandma with Alzheimer's in a home, and she doesn't want to be there. Well, we have to very carefully examine the mental state of that party at the time they're making the claim. Now, it would seem to me that the, the case that we looked at earlier tonight where the parents wanted to reprogram their adult kid and basically got away with false and falsely imprisoning him and doing other things could, could very well apply here, where if someone has got some dementia but still has some decision-making ability, arguing they shouldn't be imprisoned. All right, so let's, suppose we've got someone in that category, not really able to live on their own but not quite committable, all right, well, I'd suggest that person would probably be liable for injuries caused by a car accident. But if I'm the plaintiff, I'm going to sue the guy that's driving and the home for letting him out and let the courts sort it out. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, 
So next we turn to uh, the Brunig versus American Family Insurance Company case. And now I can turn to Mr. Fukui because, in fact, it's actually his turn. So what was going on in this Wisconsin case from 1970? Yeah, you'd, you'd have to see the TV show from the 60s. But, yeah, there was a TV show that was very silly and involved uh, Batman sometimes making the car fly. Now, if you look at what the Chief Justice writes at the very beginning of his opinion, at the top of page 171, he frames it well. There's no question that Irma Veith was subject at the time of the accident to an insane delusion which directly affected her ability to operate her car in an ordinary, prudent manner and cause the accident. Okay, do you think this case is similar to um, the case that we looked at earlier where the person had a seizure behind the wheel, or is this different? How so? Good question. As I recall, the person with the seizure had never had one before. So that makes it similar. And here, this driver, according to the undisputed record, had no idea that she was going to suddenly go nuts and think she's Batman or whatever she thought she was. And that's compared, at the bottom of page 171, to someone who's permanently insane. Remember when we, when we covered that before? Excuse me. Mr. Kalukukui, when we had permanently insane people being charged with liability for intentional tort. Do you remember those cases a little bit? What was the result? If you remember? Not true. If they're insane, up to a point they are liable. But with certain limitations. But this person, she may have ended up insane afterwards, but I think the key language is in the middle of page 172, or actually at the top of the second paragraph. Quote, we think the statement that insanity is no defense is too broad when it's applied to a negligence case as opposed to intentional force, where the driver is suddenly overcome without forewarning by a mental disability. So unforeseeable mental illness, according to this court, is a defense, and it strikes me that this really is quite consistent with the, uh, with the earlier cases. Now, take a look at the next to the last paragraph at page 172, there's a Canadian case with basically identical facts and um, the same result. Driver with a sudden, unforeseen, insane delusion goes <laughs> apparently goes after a truck in that case also, and the result is no liability because no foreseeability. With someone who is permanently insane, the foreseeability issue is... Um, quite different. Now look at the very top of page 173, and we see that most courts don't really even bother making any allowance for insane people. They just say a reasonable person. Now look at note three. It's kind of interesting. It's referring back to this Brunig case, and it asks, who's the actual defendant in that case, and what bearing does it have on the problem? The defendant's an insurance company. What bearing does that have on the problem? I can't tell you. But I can tell you that in trial, whether or not a person is covered by insurance is something that the jury is not supposed to know about. Because the idea is, if a jury knows a party is insured, they're likely to give a break to the other party, since the insurance company is going to pay and the actual party isn't going to be liable. Look at the end of note 4 on page 173. If we have already acknowledged that some cases find gifted children to a higher standard, is it reasonable to hold people with very low IQs to a lower standard? 
And the case suggested from 1965 says, in some cases, yes, if we're evaluating a party's capacity for comparative fault or contributory negligence, the fact that the, the adult farmhand really has the mentality of a 10-year-old is relevant in determining what was reasonable and what happened. Note 5 is important because it indicates that the same standard is supposed to apply whether the individual is a plaintiff or a defendant. And at note 6, we see some comments about insanity and contributory fault. We'll talk about that again when we get to it. Um, and at the top of page 174, another note about contributory negligence to put in the back of your mind for the future. The standard is a little lighter, easier on disabled people than for people that are uh, entirely uh, physically and emotionally together. And that wraps up this section, so I will stop the recording and then start it up again to consider the standard of care that we apply to defendants who are professionals.